What's up, everybody? Thursday, February 15th, 2024. Okay, let's go. Got all my tabs open here, got the questions, and this is going to be the Ask Me Anything. So let's go ahead and dive right in. As always, we've got some really good questions, got some answers prepped, some are just gonna go off the cuff and we'll be good to go, and we'll have a blast. So let's, we'll dive right in with what's probably gonna be, I think, the longest answer. So, and this is a question, something along, greetings from uh, Ecuador, right back at you. Ecuador's fantastic. Um, what was I just about to say? This is probably gonna be a question that, if I had a dollar for every time something around this question was asked, I would have many dollars. So here it is. And it's a great question. The question is from Chris Yu. I realize CrossFit is for all around fitness and not for one specific area. However, without linear progressions on the strength lifts, what is a realistic expectation regarding strength and muscle hypertrophy by doing CrossFit type workouts? Is it possible for an individual to lose muscle and strength following this type of program to be more well-rounded? So how strong can you get doing CrossFit or even better question since you're part of Lynchpin, how strong can you get doing Lynchpin? Short answer is really darn strong. And I'll get into some examples of that and give you some um, resources to check out. But let me discuss the second part of your question briefly, which is, is it possible to do mixed modality strength and conditioning training with a fitness bias, which is you know, what CrossFit is, what Lynchpin is, and lose strength? Absolutely it is. 100% it is. It all depends upon what you're coming to the program with. Because if you realize, Lynchpin is not a conditioning program. Lynchpin is not a strength program. Lynchpin is a strength and conditioning program. You will get profoundly conditioned and you will get incredibly strong. And we take a minimalist approach to that, that choose movements that have the most impact and the most transferability to other things. You don't have to do 15 different sessions in the gym. But if we're chasing well-rounded fitness, which is what we're chasing, so I want you to be able to move your body weight with calisthenics, I want you to be able to run, bike, and row, I want you to be able to lift. I want you to be able to go short, medium, and long, the whole nine yards. That's well-rounded fitness. So if you come to me as a former power lifter and you have an 800-pound deadlift and you know a similar back squat and a 600-pound bench press or some ridiculous thing, but your 5K runtime takes all of the month of January, um, you're not well-rounded by a long shot. You're profoundly strong and not much else. So, and that's not a, a hit, that's not an insult. It just, it is what it is. The same thing could be said if the individual who won the Boston Marathon this year comes to me and says, I wanna be well-rounded. I'm like, wow, you can hold a sub five mile for 26 miles and you can't deadlift 150 pounds you have a huge imbalance the other way. Again, it is, it is what it is, right? So if that power lifter came to me, if I'm gonna make that individual more well-rounded and healthier and more capable and a more dangerous human being on planet Earth, you're gonna to have to give up some of that 800 pound deadlift and that similar back squat and bench press to gain a tremendous amount of capacity in the other areas. And that doesn't mean that you'll be weak. You'll be extraordinarily strong, but now you'll be able to run and do pull-ups and burpees and box jumps and all this other stuff, but you weren't well-rounded to begin with. So in that example, would it be possible to follow a mixed modality strength and conditioning program and lose muscle or strength? Yeah, depending upon who's the individual coming in. Like I said, you could lose some conditioning with regard to your mile time if you came in as the Boston Marathon winner and we had to make you well-rounded, just it is what it is. So let's get to the other part of the question, which is without a linear progression on strength, what are the realistic expectations? And so if this all sounds too good to be true, Chris, then you should not believe me, right? Don't believe me. You should post this question, which you did under the Ask Me Anything, post it as a, just a general comment in the Facebook group for people to post their real world experiences on 
and post it in the Linchpin Squad feature on BTWB for real people to give their experience from. Ask who's done a just a linear strength progression before, who hasn't, what results are they seeing based upon the linear strength, based upon what we do at Linchpin, and then you'll get the real world answers. But this question has come up a bunch, and so I'm here to tell you, linear strength progressions are effective. But there was a time in the world also where that was the only way to get strong, pre-CrossFit days, which was most of the fitness culture. You know, CrossFit's relatively young, all things considered. So mixed modality strength and conditioning programs are a relatively new uh, thing. And so if you wanted to get better at squatting or deadlifting, you just followed a linear progression, you squatted and deadlift all the time, and you crept up in your percentages, your rep range, et cetera, et cetera, and you worked in the deload week and you started back over and it was what it was. Now, you know, just the assumption that that's the only way to get strong I would say in 2024 is a very outdated, antiquated, inaccurate, and just, you know, it's massively uh, in need of an update. And I'm not saying that's, you know, your thought, but I think that thought still exists in in strength culture. Uh, you know, the world has changed a lot. And I'll also say that all, not all mixed modality strength and conditioning programs, you know, like Lynchman, they're not all created equal. So I can't speak for what will happen to you um, on a different program, but I can tell you that at Lynchman, yeah, you're going to get really strong. And again, if you ask other folks, they will they will tell you that in their own words. I think what's confusing about it is when people see a linear progression laid out, it just is like adding a little building block on each week. It just makes this makes perfect sense. It's easy to follow. You don't need an in-depth programming or strength and conditioning knowledge to, to see it. When you look at mixed modality programming, it's really complicated and it's really challenging to create a program that like, hey, you just want to increase your squat and I don't care at all what happens to your pull-ups. I don't care at all what happens to your 5K run. That's really easy to do, really easy. Now I want to create a program that keeps you in the gym the smallest amount of time possible, gets you really strong, and at the same time makes you a better runner, but not just at short distances, also at long, and the same thing is going to make you better at burpees and pull-ups and handstand walking and all this other stuff. Oh, and we're going to mix in the Olympic lifts all at the same time, all without leaving anything behind, all while gradually adding capacity to the athlete without overtraining them. That's probably why most people don't do that sort of programming because it's, it's, it's very challenging to do. But um, the wonderful thing about mixed modality programming is, you know, the human body is one piece. And if you're doing a program that has intentionally laid out variants, since none of us are perfect human beings, you probably have some sort of deficiency, weakness, or imbalance that you're probably not even aware of. And that might be holding back your squat, your deadlift, your clean and jerk, your whatever it happens to be. And by doing well-rounded programming, you're not only going to get exposed exposure to those major lifts in a way that will make them increase to get you stronger, but you're going to hit all these other aspects of your body and shore up some weaknesses that you weren't even aware existed, and then you'll be better when you slide under the barbell to squat it or grab the barbell to deadlift it. You know, you're not going to see in a linear strength progression for squats or deadlifts sprinting, but you better believe that sprinting will make you better at squats and deadlifting and make you a more explosive athlete. So again, the power of variance and seeing things that you don't traditionally see in a linear strength prog progression is what makes an intentionally and intelligently designed mixed modality strength and conditioning program so darn effective, yet so mysterious to the uninitiated when they look at it, they can't figure out why it works. Pull-ups, you're probably not going to see a bunch of pull-ups in your back squat program or your deadlift linear strength progression program, but you better believe that a strong back is going to be your friend for the back squat and the deadlift. You know, the body is one piece, and variance is a wonderful thing. And I called up some, you know, and these are countless things, but I called up some examples here which you might get a, a kick out of just random people posting their strength gains. Jamie S., shoulder squat, a shoulder squat, shoulder press, one rep max of 225 pounds. That's a monster, no linear progression. Um, Douglas M, lift PR on the back squat, three rep max back squat at 330 pounds, no linear strength progression. 
And today he says, I hit a 25 pound PR on my three rep max deadlift. That's insane. What else do we have? People love hearing these. Jen W, strong lady, lift PR, eight rep deadlift for Jen at 265 pounds. An eight rep deadlift for her. Are you kidding me? 265, that's insane. No deadlift progression. Jonathan B, lift PR, front squat, two rep max at 315 pounds. The old 315 pound front squat for a double with no strength dedicated uh, linear progression. This one's awesome. From Phil T, lift PR on my front squat, run one rep max of 335 pounds. That's what Phil says. A 60, that's six zero, a 60 pound PR on his front squat up from his previous lift of 275 pounds to 335 pounds in the front squat in just under one year's time at 51 years old. He says, this stuff works. How wonderful is that? At 51 years old, to already have a monster front squat of 275 pounds, to put 60 pounds on it in one year with no linear strength progression. That's confusing, isn't it? Yes, because well thought out mixed modality strength and conditioning program is confusing to a lot of people as to why it works. And this one from Buck, a lift PR, a five rep clean and jerk at 225 pounds. That's a nice set of five. Just hold on to that barbell for five reps at 225 pounds. So, and they go on and on and on. So yes. And I even called up the, um, the BTWB data for one rep max back squats and deadlifts, you know, or whatnot. And let's say for the back squat, you're in the 80th percentile for men anyway, if you can back squat 352 pounds, you're in the 80th percentile, which means you're in the top 20%. That's astonishing. And that's of the people that post on BTWB, which by the way, it's not normal human beings, like walking through the mall. These are people who take their fitness profoundly seriously and be in the 80th percentile with a one rep max back squat of 352 pounds. I'm here to tell you, that is profoundly achievable, and we have a ton of people, as crazy as it is, back squatting in the high threes, 400 pounds, and over 400 pounds, which is crazy, again, with no linear progression. And on the deadlift, an 80th percentile deadlift for guys is 425 pounds. That happens all the time, and there's plenty of people in linchpin astonishingly strong with their deadlift north of 500 pounds, which is crazy. And that puts you in the 95th percentile, which is insane. So I'll leave you with this, Chris, fantastic question. I'm gonna leave you with a few linchpin conversation episodes that we've done previously on this topic. You can scratch down the episode numbers and at your leisure, go ahead and and listen to them or watch them because they all hit your topic in one way, shape, or form, and it'll give you a big breadth and depth of, of knowledge on the subject. The first is Lynchman Conversations number 125, and that covers periodization, strength cycles, and more. Then check out episode 376. It's on progressive overload. Check out 393. That's entitled Lynchman is Different by Design. 382. Can You Be Too Strong? It's a fun one. Episode 408, Minimalist Strength and Conditioning Explained. Episode 400, Lynchman is Not Classic CrossFit. And then finally, episode 364, which was when I interviewed Tanner, who's arguably the strongest member of Lynchpin. And he, what's interesting about Tanner is he entered Lynchpin really strong. He actually entered Lynchpin so strong that you would say, this guy's so, he's already like a level 99 squatter, done linear progressions his whole life, lifting cycles, and so now this guy's coming over to a non-linear strength cycle, to a mixed modality strength and conditioning program, and he's a 99 level squatter. He's already at the top of the, of the pyramid. He's not gonna go down without some like super specific just squat cycle, right? So Tanner entered Lynchpin with a 425 pound back squat. It's a fantastic squat. Um, maybe that's like level 95, or I can't remember, but yeah, 425 pound back squat. At the time that I interviewed him, 
which was over a year ago, his back squat following linchpin had gone from 425 pounds to 565 pounds. Let that sink in for a second. Entered at 425 pounds later, and I think he'd been with Lynchman three years at the time of the interview, and it was 565 pounds. So what is that? That's a 140 pound increase on an already elite level squatter without following a linear strength cycle. So again, don't believe me, ask members of the, of the community and go ahead and check out those episodes. Okay, great question. Next question from Corey C. What is something that the sport of CrossFit pushes that you don't agree with? For example, the games, a methodology, a particular movement, uh, a brand, gear, um, you know, the sport. So in your question, you specifically say the sport of CrossFit pushes that I don't agree with. In my mind, I separate the sport of CrossFit to what you and I do every day, which is just the methodology to, to increase my long-term health and fitness. So the sport, I don't think the sport presented that I don't agree with, because I see that as a totally separate world that I don't have to worry about, meddle with, it doesn't influence my training. The only possible thing would be if somebody just follows, follows their CrossFit Games heroes on Instagram, their training protocols, and thinks that's the amount of like reps and volume and loading that they need to do. I don't think that's gonna go well for them. But that's not the fault of the sport of CrossFit. It's just people following things they shouldn't on social media. So there's not too many things that I don't agree with. There's there's things that I might think are like unnecessary. Like there's some maybe like uh, barbell complexes or whatnot that you know involve getting a huge load overhead, and then instead of just dropping it and see who and who had the best clean and jerk, you know you bring it like back down to the hang at some like crazy loading and then like hit a hang clean and receive it below parallel and then like have to try to jerk it again. Like it's just, that's a lot to ask of people. And I know those are the top tier athletes, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask that of, of, of most people, but that's, I mean, I'm reaching for that one really. Cause like I said, I separate it and a brand or gear that I disagree with. Um, I'd have to think about that. I don't have any clue who's sponsoring the games right now to be honest with you. Um, oh, uh, Go Ruck is. But I mean, most of the most of the sponsors that you know negotiate some sort of contract, it just was mutually beneficial to both companies and they liked the numbers associated and then the sponsorship deal is, is inked. So I don't uh, I don't have too many things that pop in my mind in that because I said I'm doing a pretty good job of separating the two in my head. Okay, Cass F. When logistics mean running outside is off the table, is running on the spot or running in place or running to a low step up really more effective than just doing another form of cardio such as bike or row? So she's got a two part question, so I'll answer that one first. Is it more effective? Depends upon what you're, how you're defining effective, um, meaning more effective than biking or rowing. It's certainly different and it's certainly 100% effective. And if you have the opportunity to do that, if you also have a bike and a rower, Plenty of workouts are gonna have a bike called for or a row called for. And so if it does, you have the opportunity to hop on that. If it calls for a run and you can do running in place or running up to a low step like you're saying, that's a great way to really closely mimic the actual stimulus of that day. You're supporting your own body weight. And so I would go ahead and do that. And it's, you've probably done it, Cass, but for most people, anyone who hasn't, it's way more challenging than it sounds. If you and I'm really talking like high knees, because when you go out for a run, you don't really run with your knees hitting like waist level. But if you did like two minutes of high knees in place, you would be exhausted if you could even continue it continuously nonstop for two minutes. So you wouldn't have to get your knees that high, but running in place for the desired time frame, it was 400 meter run, so you're gonna run in place for two minutes and get your knees at whatever height starts to make your breathing rate feel at a similar pace as it would if you were really out pounding the pavement on a 400 meter run. If you have that enough, enough exposure and knowledge of your own body and enough runs under your belt to know what that would feel like, then that's how I would kind of simulate that for the running in place. It's a great option and you can do it anywhere. Second part of a question, the daily accessory work, which is optional. 
Do these factor into your decisions on what to program for the main linchpin sessions for the upcoming four week cycle? If so, how do you decide on which accessories to add in during the week? So short answer is no, they don't factor in the upcoming because the I will program all the workouts first because those are overwhelmingly by like 10x or 1000x more important than the accessory work. So I'll lay out all four weeks just the main workout of the day and make sure the interplay is there and everything that should from the gross movement patterns to the loadings to the time domains to interference or lack thereof, like it's all exactly how it should because that's the most important stuff by far. Then once that's there, accessory work will be laid in on top of that. And the accessory work will be usually, but not always, complementary to whatever occurred in the workout. Okay, so let's say for example, um, a workout had some below parallel and it had some squats, wall balls, air squats, back squats, whatever it happened to be. Well, the accessory work for that particular day could most likely involve some additional below parallel leg strengthening, be it Bulgarian split squats, pistols, what, you know, something like that, for example. And the reason, if you're, anyone's unfamiliar with that, is like, people might say, okay, well, why would you do that? You know, we squatted during the workout, so why would you put us below parallel again in the accessory work? First of all, the accessory work's optional, so if you're not ready for it, don't do it. Why wouldn't you put that on a different day that we didn't squat? Aha, uh -huh, good question. And that's because then you would never get a break from squatting. So think about it. Let's say that you're gonna work out five days during the week, okay? And on two of those days, you're going to go below parallel. Well, if I put the below parallel accessory work on days that you don't go below parallel, you're already going below parallel twice during the workout of the days. Then you're gonna have three other workouts, right? Because we're working out five times. And so now if the below parallel accessory work goes on a day that you didn't go below parallel, now you're going below parallel four times during a five workout training cycle. That's too much. That doesn't leave time for recovery. That's not gonna move the needle forward for people. So again, this is why the accessory work is optional um, because some people don't, it treats them very, very well. When you do it on the same day that you also went below parallel, but you're doing this nice accessory piece, then it, it allows you to not have the interference of that gross movement pattern for the one or two following days so that your body actually recovers. If I put it on different days, you'd never recover from going below parallel. You could say that same game for pressing overhead, upper body pulling, pulling from the ground, whatever it happens to be. So the accessory work is not only selected very intentionally to complement whatever the workout of the day was, but the days on which we put it in are also very intentional so that the athlete doesn't get overtrained, doesn't get beat up, and actually has time to recover. You know, maybe the workout of the day had some pressing overhead, some push press, some jerks, whatever it happened to be. Well, maybe in the accessory work that day, there's gonna be a great single joint movement that's a bit lower intensity. Maybe you're gonna do some Turkish get-ups. Fantastic movement, great movement and a beautiful accessory to pressing overhead. It's gonna hit you a little bit different, great stabilization. And then, you know, I wouldn't put it the next day because if I put it on a different day, then you never get a break from pressing overhead. And so that's kind of, you know, a general uh, theme that maybe you can keep in your head there. Did I fully answer your question? Let's see. Okay, I think I did, I think I did. Eric F. So Eric F, you're asking about cheat days and you're asking about the cheat day cycle that you're in right now where you eat um, really clean six days a week and then you burn it down on one day, I actually covered your specific question for an entire episode. And so if you're interested in hearing the whole conversation about cheat days and cheat meals and lessons learned and what I've experimented with over the years, check out Lynchpin Conversations number 437. And that actually just took place two days ago on February 13th, which was Tuesday. So you should be good to go there. Okay, Ben Lees. Hi, Pat. Hi, Ben. Stretching. I'm trying hard to improve my mobility. I tend to stretch for 15 minutes or so at the end of a workout using a guided program uh, because that's when I can make the time and space to do it. 
Is stretching immediately after a workout effective? Is there an optimal time to stretch relative to the day's workout? Thanks for the great programming. So it sounds like you're right on course, generally speaking, for most people. you Ideally, you would do the workout, and then you'd have your cool down and stretching, you know. You finish the workout, heart's pounding, you know, muscles are burning, whatever it happens to be. You do your 5 to 15 minutes of nice casual walking, jogging, biking, rowing, whatever it is. And then you do your stretches right then, call it a day and go home. That would be when I would work those in for you. So I think you're right. I think you're right where you need to be. Um, what you don't want to do, most people are not going to find a lot of benefit stretching a cold muscle, which is why it's nice to do it at the end of the workout and after the cool down session there. Jeff Roundtree. Love the discussion last week on time goals with modulating intensity. A follow up on that. Do you also consider which workout to do based on intensity? For instance, doing a scaled option on a low intensity day. Oh, okay, I see. I seem to recall you mentioning trying to do a limited equipment option or a scaled option each week. Just curious as to how that uh, decision regards to intensity. So I don't choose a scaled option or the dumbbell option, the limited equipment option, uh, that doesn't factor into my intensity decision. So my intensity decision is based on, on the factors we discovered, we discussed one or two episodes ago. I scale on a low, moderate, or high intensity day, just if if the movement or whatever it happens to be like dictates me scaling, you know, like I've got a terrible overhead position, a bad neck, like that's what's gonna dictate whether I scale or not. Most of the time, you know, I'll ratchet down the pace will be my number one way to modulate the intensity, not necessarily choosing the scale option. I'll, I'll scale if, you know, what I have going on with my body makes it a smart decision to scale. And I don't choose the dumbbell option, the limited equipment option, as a way to modulate intensity either, because as a matter of fact, the dumbbell option is certainly not a way to modulate intensity. That is a spicy level 10 hot sauce sort of experience for most people. But it's the same deal with dumbbells. I will choose a different, if I'm doing the dumbbell option, I could do the dumbbell option at high, moderate, or low intensity. So all of those things fit. And I would just scale the dumbbell option if maybe the load didn't make sense for me or I couldn't do the particular movement, like I don't have the flexibility to do a one-arm um, squat snatch with a dumbbell, that's not gonna happen. So I'll modify based upon that or I'll scale based upon that. But um, the intensity is usually just me ratcheting down the pace at which I'm doing the workout. So hopefully that helps. Dave D. Uh, uh, getting acclimated uh, to various elevations. Here we go. Now that I'm into my second week, second week at 3,500 feet above sea level, I'm normally at home is 40 feet above sea level. I still have 95 days at this height and the daily workouts are really taking a toll on me. I hear you, brother. Any thoughts oh, through your travels with work around the world? Any tips for getting acclimated any quicker? There might be somebody very sharp on how to do this that has like a, a surefire way, but I personally found one of the best ways to get acclimated is to do exactly what you're doing. Keep working out, scale and modify things as needed, make sure your diet's clean, drink plenty of water, and get good sleep. The basics, really, and it just takes a while to get acclimated. I moved from sea level to Denver, Colorado, you know, mile high of elevation, 5,000 feet or whatever it is. And I lived there for several years and it was, it took a while to get acclimated there. But on week one, I was still at the park doing a 400 meter repeat and it murdered me and my times were off and that was it. An interesting thing that I found is a lot of times since there's less oxygen or the, um, whatever the great scientific way to say that would be, you know, less oxygen available, the higher that you go, a lot of people, that will affect your times. There's just no way around it. So a lot of people actually will put out faster times at sea level because they are able to actually gulp down some more oxygen. So you might have this this you know hit on your times. Don't be shocked if that actually happens. But again, that was my experience from living in Denver for three years. I've done uh, Dumbbell Fran in Bogota, Colombia, and Quito, Ecuador. How fun is that? Let's see, what are those two elevations? Bogota, Colombia, elevation. Uh, okay, so Bogota, Colombia is 8,612 feet. I did Dumbbell Fran there, and I thought I was going to die. 
But the interesting thing about a workout like Fran at elevation is it's such a short workout and it's largely anaerobic, so without the presence of oxygen. Now, obviously, you need oxygen, right? Uh, but not sustainable long term, high intensity, short duration. That I could actually ride the wave and stay ahead of that lack of oxygen and stay ahead of the elevation. Knock out Fran and then. When the elevation hit me is when I was laying on the ground, feeling like the Grim Reaper was just driving his bony hands into my chest, squeezing the life out of my heart and ripping it out of my body as I was just trying to suck wind to, to not die. It was the recovery, like the, the next five to 15 minutes post Fran were awful. If I was to do a longer workout, like a 15 or 20 minute workout, you're gonna be working out so long that the elevation is gonna become a factor right away. But on a short, sharp, like, bomb sort of a workout, I could almost stay ahead of it. Uh, and then the other one was, where was that, did I just say? Keto Ecuador. That was disgusting as well. Keto elevation. Where's the elevation in keto? Elevation in keto, 9,350 feet above sea level. That was a really bad deal also. So yeah, elevation's a great time. Let's see. Uh, Irina F. What are your thoughts on hot yoga? I've been doing hot yoga every Sunday since before I joined CrossFit and I can't figure out whether it's a recovery activity or a workout. It's mostly planks and holds, but it gets super sweaty. But I'm not lifting weights or jumping or anything like that. I want to make sure I'm resting enough and with this routine, I have only one rest day. So I don't have a tremendous amount of experience with hot yoga, although when I was actually living in Colorado, like I said before, I did attend several classes. I think maybe I did like five and then I tapped out. Um, you're right, I was a sweaty mess. And yeah, you're not lifting weights, you're not whatever. But I'll tell you what, it was hard work. So challenging, so difficult, especially for somebody like me that's not flexible. And yeah, planks and holds for extended periods of time that are profoundly challenging. So. You know, I, I wouldn't call it active recovery, to be quite honest with you. I mean, it's, it's hard work. It just depends upon you as an individual figuring out where is your priority. How many days of strength and conditioning or, or lynchman do you want to do? How many days of hot yoga do you want to do? Are those two interfering? And it might be a situation where you can't have it all, right? You may be able to do three linchpin workouts and two hot yoga sessions per week or vice versa. Three hot yoga sessions, two linchpin workouts or some some mixture like that. Four linchpin workouts, one hot yoga. That's going to be up to you to experiment with and find out what that little sweet spot is where you don't feel overtrained. You're not just walking around tired and beat up. You're not sore all the time. You're still performing well in your workouts. Your mental acuity is where you want. You're getting enough sleep. So you might have to play with that a little bit and experiment. But I would say that is hard work in those sessions. Okay, Troy R. I'm a firefighter. Appreciate that, Troy. I work 48 hours straight and then I'm off 96 hours. I've always been fascinated by that schedule. 96 hours off, doesn't that sound great? It really does. Most times I don't work out at the fire station. I train four days, I train four days, then I take two days off. I'm trying to figure out how to make it work without just doing the workouts as they fall, then not worry about what the community is doing that particular day. Okay, you know, this is very similar to, to a topic we've discussed several times, which is people have asked like, hey, I can only work out three days a week. How do I select which workouts to do? Because there's five posted. So if I'm only gonna do three, how do I select them? Now you're gonna do four, so you're gonna be very similar to this. So I would recommend, I looked this up for you so you wouldn't have to do it, that you go ahead and check out Lynchpin Conversations number 128. It's entitled Help, I Can Only Do Three Workouts a Week. And I think that general mindset that's discussed in that particular episode, you could easily apply to four workouts per week, and then you would be just in a great place as an athlete. So go ahead and check that out. Uh, let's see, Michael G, how did you decide on orange for the Lynchpin color? I, mean, you, I saw this question this morning when you posted it and I was racking my brain as to try to remember how I did that and I can't remember the totally accurate answer right now. I will tell you that a lot of time, thought and effort went into it 
and, and I narrowed it down to several colors and I just, I just landed on the orange. I can't tell you why though, I forget. And I'm not keeping it from you, I just don't recall. Josh B. Okay, so Josh B's, uh, let's see. Okay, I've got a question basically, which is basically, you've got a workout like Monday that had 10 down to one of the back squat, okay? And that was at 50% of your one rep max. And then the dumbbell option has a, a different rep scheme. You're gonna, you know, so it's 55 back squats for the regular workout of the day, but if you chose the uh, limited equipment option, it was more than 55 squats with the dumbbells. Let's say it was, uh, I don't know if he's saying it's 100, I can't remember what it was off the top of my head, but how is that math done? So that math is generally done by taking, for example, on, this is an inter interesting question actually, because a lot of the classic um, percentage-based lifting charts, you know, um, this is a good overall rep range to get at this percentage of your one rep max for this many sets, this many reps and whatnot. Those are useful, but they're usually classically written up about um, Olympic lifters or power lifters, not mixed modality athletes like we are. And so over the course of the years, I've developed it just in my head and, and writing a program with so many people, of like my own kind of version of those charts and they've worked out really well as to, for mixed modality athletes, what percentage at what rep scheme of different movements is a really great strength training day. And so 10 down to one, 50% for the back squat was a good overall, overall total volume and then individual descending set volume at that, at that loading. And it wasn't supposed to be this miserable beat you up super heavy sort of loading day again that's there's so many ways to get strong that's not just heavies ones threes and fives and things like that you know like lighter days so to speak with a, a larger amount of volume is another fantastic piece of variance to get people strong now on and that's that's generally what i'm going to do for squats deads cleans all that kind of stuff but now i know while people can modify their uh, their back squat based upon whatever their one rep max is and use 50% on the dumbbell side of the house, it's a bit more challenging because most people don't have adjustable dumbbells. Most people don't have like 17 different sets of dumbbells. So the challenge for the dumbbell workouts is trying to find a general prescription that if somebody just has a pair of 50s or a pair of 35s, what's an overall amount of volume that for most people under most circumstances is going to replicate the stimulus of the regular workout of the day that for people who have access to a back squat and squat racks. And that's a continual challenge, an awesome challenge and a fun challenge actually with the dumbbell workouts. And that is something that has just developed quite frankly over the course of years and years of me, of me doing this stuff and finding that sweet spot. And so on this particular day, um, Yes, like a percentage was given, I had a, a loading in my head, I took 50% of that loading for the typical athlete, did some math to figure out if we had the dumbbells available, how many reps overall would you have to do in order to make that happen with the dumbbells? Okay, there are the reps. Well, a 10 down to one doesn't really work out that way, so we're gonna modify the dumbbell workout that will look different than the regular workout of the day, but the stimulus will be preserved. And so that's kind of the, the thought process behind that. Second part it says for also for Monday's workout, which was 10 out of one of the back squat, I think a 200 meter run, and then 20 set 20 push-ups after each set. You usually say something like, "Do the back squats feel too light? Well, then burn down the runs." Here you said the runs should be a jog. Is that a license to break up the squat weight if we uh, feel those are too light? Uh, is that a license to break up the squat weight? If we feel those are too light, the push-ups took me so long that I was recovered from the squats. Is that a license to break up the squats if we feel that those were too light? So on Monday's workout with the 10 down to one, it was very intentionally not supposed to be a burn it down sort of a day. And it was allowing the athlete to jog, you know, it wasn't supposed to be this crazy like heavy day to high heart rate sort of a deal. It was gonna be probably more of a moderate effort. And so it was very much like let yourself recover on the runs. You have the push-ups gonna take some time so that ideally when you slide back under that bar for the back squats, 
since it's 50% of your one rep max, and since the it's descending in reps, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, that they ideally should always feel like you have the ability to do that session of squats unbroken. Now, if you burned it down on the runs, that would change the nature of the squats, and that's not really what I want on this particular day. So hopefully, hopefully that helps there. Let's see. Um, three more questions? No, let's see, I've got a few more. Lauren asks, thoughts on barefoot shoes? I've worn them now for one and a half years for every workout, weightlifting and even mountain hiking. Increased my mobility significantly, especially in my heels. Body awareness is way better. I think this is a logical thing for CrossFit. would love to hear your thoughts and maybe predictions on this. I don't have a ton of experience with the barefoot shoes. I have a good buddy that lived in them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, did all the workouts in them. Ian Wittenberg, who I did the motorcycle trip with, and he loved them. And he basically would echo all the sentiments that you just had there. Um, but I don't have personal experience with them, but I can see everything that you're saying making perfect sense. So would love to hear your thoughts and maybe predictions on this. This is a logical thing for CrossFit. It might be. Um, I also don't think it's totally necessary. I think that's one of those things where if you'd like to do it, great. If not, you don't have to. But I know very few people who used those barefoot shoes, like you're saying, and had bad things to say about them. Most people actually enjoyed them. So I tend to think that they are overwhelmingly positive. Joseph W., would you recommend Lynchton programming for teens in the off-season from their sport? Also, what level of frequency? I have a 13-year-old boy and girl twins who are involved in youth sports. I want them to develop all-around athleticism with the increased sport-specific injuries due to overuse. I feel that the program would, would be beneficial. It absolutely would be beneficial. So, Joseph, the short answer is most likely yes. Um, what you should do... We did a great episode on this. Go to the Very Not Random podcast or the BTWB YouTube channel. You can find the episode there. But it's a Very Not Random that Adrian and I interviewed a gentleman by the name of Todd Widman. And it was training kids because that is his world. I can't remember which episode it was, but it's a fantastic information-packed episode that I think will answer a lot of your questions really well as to what you should do, at what age, how much. So, very not random. Interview with Todd Widman, T-O-D-D-W-I-D-M-A-N, and it's on um, kids. David B., how would you mix linchpin with uh, jujitsu? I roll three times a week. Is it a matter of just picking three days, or can I double up with no rest day? I'm a recovering volume addict. I appreciate your honesty there. So you start to work out too much. So I will tend to do more, not less, and then I will burn out. We certainly want to avoid that. By the way, you were my level one instructor around 2012 with Kalipa, Barber, and Neil Maddox. Glad I found my way to Lynchpin. Very cool, 2012. Wow. What I would recommend is you post this question in the Lynchpin BTWP squad in the private Facebook group because we have a ton of people that do mixed martial arts. And you'll get to hear their real world experience from this as well and that what their lessons learned as to volume and how many workouts. But you're rolling three times a week. Is it just picking three days that I can double up with no rest day? It just depends, kind of like a question I had earlier as to what your body is going to tolerate. Are you still making advances in your lifts and runs and body weight movements? Your fitness driving forward? Do you feel burnt out? How's your mental acuity? Are you too tired? All that good stuff. I can't tell you whether you should do two days of one, three days of the other, or vice versa. And it also just depends upon for you, like the other question I answered, what's your priority? Because you might not be able to have it all. You might have to kind of pick which one it gets slanted towards. If it's fitness, then maybe it's three workouts a week and you roll twice. If Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is your whole world, then maybe you roll three times a week and the fitness takes a back seat. There's no right or wrong answer. It just depends upon what you want. Claudette, always good to hear from you. Will you be doing any more Lynchpin member interviews? It was so nice to hear from people from the active community, rock stars to the quiet, consistent members too. Like moms with many kids who work out and homeschooling, etc. very inspiring. It's a great idea. Probably should start that again. There's always just so much stuff to do. There's just so much stuff. But that's a great idea. I probably should make that a priority again. And uh, you'd like to get your hands on some Lynchpin socks. 
feel that test 13 would be less gross if it had some linchpin socks. Let me see what's available there. And then David E, final question, is Valentine's Day a real holiday? If you ask my wife, she'll say yes. Okay, all right, well, that's it everybody. Great questions, um, thanks for being awesome. Today's Thursday, it's a rest day, enjoy it. And I will see you back here tomorrow.